Before I begin the sermon, let me explain some of the circumstances of my being here. I belong to the ACC, the Anglican Catholic Church, which is in communion with this denomination. Therefore, the privileges that I enjoy in the ACC, I may also enjoy in this parish here. I am a licensed lay reader with the parish in Richmond, and I have been an Anglican since my birth. I am not, however, allowed to write a sermon, so I have a sermon that has been written for me. <laughs> I say this because uh, you will hear many vague things about people being in elevated to the diaconate or made a priest or a lay reader or something. And each of these things, each of these actions actually has some kind of consequences. And uh, the longer you worship with the Anglican communion, you will find out more of the inner workings of how all these things are put together. But so that your conscience may be eased, I am not reading to you a sermon I have written myself. <laughs> Paul writes to the parish, to St. Timothy's Anglican Church, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in my prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Such is the substance of St. Paul's opening introduction to his first letter to the church of Thessalonica. As I thought about our unusual situation of being separate from you for this time, first time, since the founding of St. Timothy, it occurred to me that most of that which we know and practice in our church concerning the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is derived from 13 letters of an essentially absentee bishop. Although Paul spent a considerable time shepherding his diocesan church in Ephesus and its sister church in Corinth, and he also spent a considerable time nurturing the Christians in Rome during his imprisonment, he was never resident in any church longer than I have already been resident in St. Timothy. Being a co-laborer with God in building a parish church is a work of considerable labor and love and thus it must be grieved, it must have grieved Paul considerably to have been separated from any one of his churches for so long especially when there was controversy and conflict within those very churches Paul knew that there was controversy and conflict but there was nothing he could do about it not in Corinth and not in Galatia not in person because he was constantly on the move or he was in prison. All he could do was to write letters, commend his churches to God, and hope for the best. And let's for a moment get in perspective the Pauline diocese. There was Rome, Ephesus and Corinth, Thessalonica and Galatia, Colossians and Philippians, seven churches. He makes mention of Laodicea, but we do not have the epistle that he says he wrote to them in our possession. It is forever lost to history. Remember, three of Paul's epistles are short pastoral letters of advice to what we think were two of his most effective leaders, one to Titus, which we read from a little this morning, and two to his son in faith, Timothy. And there is a short personal letter from Paul to Philemon, concerning a runaway slave. Thus we have one bishop absent from his churches for much of the time and letters to his seven churches. That's what Christianity was built on. That's what Christianity is built upon. Many there be that make reference to the exploits of the 12 apostles but we have very little substantive information about them or about their ministries. And two of them from Christ's inner circle, Peter and John, reappear in the Pauline diocese. Peter refers to Paul's letters as scripture. And John refers to himself in his own epistles 
not as an apostle, but as an elder, a term and title that has meaning only in the Pauline diocese. What happened to the other apostles? Judas, of course, betrayed Christ and hanged himself. James the Less, the third member of Christ's inner three, was martyred early on by Herod. Matthew writes a gospel that could almost be taken as a prologue to the gospel according to Paul, as I maintain in my book, The Jonas Genre. But what of Andrew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot. Christian tradition claims that all seven of these apostles were martyred, and yet nothing of any historical substance or historical reliability survives from these men. So we are back again to a considerable consideration of the work of one man, Paul, as the fundamental basis and foundation of Christianity in the ancient and in the modern world. As, and do you remember, how the church of Ephesus started? Paul is passing through on one of his missionary tours through Asia Minor, and he finds certain disciples, and yet all they really know is the baptism of John the Baptist. This is some 20 years after the ascension of Christ, and yet they know nothing of the baptism of Christ in the Holy Ghost. Paul must labor hard and long to help them to make his, this theological transition. And do you remember how many disciples there were? Twelve. That's all. That's what Paul starts with as his own diocesan seat. A dozen people. And no one can read the epistles of Paul and not know that they begin, they live, and they mostly end in controversy. His diocese was constantly besieged by the Judaizers, by controversy, by conflict, by ridicule, by persecution. Listen to what he says in his second letter to the church of Corinth. Of the Jews five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often in perils of wonders, of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And not only this, not only is there persecution from his own countrymen and from the pagans and from the Romans, not only is there controversy and conflict in his seven churches, some of which he can hardly call his own, but there is also controversy within his own missionary entourage, and this controversy tears apart his own missionary team. Mark, the writer of our second gospel, leaves him suddenly in the middle of a missionary tour, and Mark unceremoniously returns to Jerusalem. And this leads to a subsequent bitter controversy between Paul and Barnabas. They part company over this conflict, never to be reconciled. And when I think about these things, when I think about how early Christianity began in hopeless obscurity against seemingly hopeless odds in just a handful of churches with just a handful of people in a hostile environment in the midst of controversy and weakness with very little material support for the sole missionary to the Gentile world which was even then in the midst of social unrest and long-term civilizational collapse. I think of our own mission. People tell me that our jurisdiction has no chance of succeeding. It is just a minuscule remnant of a disintegrating Episcopal Church of America. They say, just as Paul's churches 
were the minuscule remnant of a decrepit Judaism. We have only a handful of clergy, just as Paul had only a handful of faithful men to help him. And we minister in a post-Christian civilization which totters on the brink of complete political and socio-economic collapse, just as Paul ministered in a post-Jewish civilization. One could even say a post-Greco-Roman civilization, on the brink of complete political and socio-economic collapse. And all St. Paul had was his own travels by foot or by sea, which was perhaps double walking speed, and letters to cover a diocese that stretched from Jerusalem to Rome about 1,400 miles. No automobiles, no trains, no planes. That's all he had. And he had prayer, and he had commitment, and he had faith, and he had dedication, and he had loyalty, and he had vision, and he had duty, and he had honor. And he had the promises of the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit from which he believed that he could never be separated. And in the end, St. Paul was right. And the Gospel of Paul conquered the whole world. In St. Paul, God showed the world that strength did not rest in numbers nor did it rest in technology, nor did it rest in favorable cultural climate or on any other human advantage. No, the strength of God rested in weakness. The strength of God rested in faith. The strength of God rested in our confidence that through him we can accomplish anything God wants us to do. St. Paul learned this lesson and so has our communion. And so have I. St. Paul eventually arrived at a position from which he could never be removed. He said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And in the final analysis he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. My prayer in Christ is that no matter how much I am separated from you, no matter how difficult the odds or impoverished the resources or hostile the environment, no matter if it be the distance from Jerusalem to Rome, there is nothing that can keep us from our destiny to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.